All right, so this is pretty sweet. What are we doing uh, while we catch up, okay? Uh, well, I'm trying to learn this language called Haskell, and it's completely different than all other languages that I've ever used, but I'm very interested in it. Um, so in this, I'm going to be basically uh, playing around with it, having a good play. Um, yeah, trying to, um, you know, I'm going to write some programs that I usually write when I'm learning programming languages. And we're just going to see how it goes. Now, full disclosure, if you haven't seen already, I've already made a guessing game and a rock, paper, scissors game already. So you'll have to forgive me. Uh, but we can quickly go through some of the other stuff that I usually do. Okay, but uh, first, what is Haskell, right? You might be wondering if you haven't heard. I mean, I doubt it. If you, well, I mean, it depends. Uh, so Haskell is a functional programming language. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a func? All programming languages, if you can write programs in them, are functional. No, it's functional in a different way. Um, here. Say we have... Actually, let's just do this. Here. Test a few. Say we have function in Python. Yeah? If I was to write a... Um, some program, right? This is going to be super trivial. X, Y, return X, Y, or X plus Y. All right, this is a super trivial example, right? So this function in Python takes two inputs, the variables X and Y, or the, the arguments X and Y, and it takes the sum of them. So this function is said to be pure in that I do not change any A global variables, and I don't change the values of the arguments. So if I said x plus 3, and then I do this, this, this is right here, a change in state. What does that mean? Well, state is basically the current setup of the world, right? It's, it's the, the current, uh, you know, like if you were to take a picture of something, right, that is how it is in that snapshot, right? So before I modified X, it would be as it was when it was passed into the function. But now it's been totally changed, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, but you know, I could theoretically do the same thing where I have like z equals five, and in here I could be like, oh z, why are you opening up Steam? I don't want you open. Be gone. Be gone. Thought. Um, but we could theoretically have z here, and I could, uh, you know, every time I add something, I could just mutate as in change uh, the value of that global variable. I'm changing the environment. I'm changing um, these variables, uh, which is deemed to be bad. And there's some reasons for this. Um, functional programming is, um, from what I understand, is more um, related to mathematics in how functions operate. How do I mean? Um, in mathematics, like in algebra, you have certain properties, right? You have the identity property, which is one of the few properties I remember. And that is basically that x is equal to x, right? This, the, this property basically says that for a value x, it will always be equal to itself, right? And in mathematics, the equal sign does not mean assignment. It does not mean I am temporarily changing the value of this thing. It is saying that both things are exactly the same. Uh, and this will get you into kind of like existential territory where if in your program you say x is equal to 5 
and then you know later on in your program maybe you're in a loop or something so you say x is equal to x plus one this this right here is impossible right because you know okay sure say this we wanted to test this somehow what we would do is we would take the value of x that we have right up here and we would put it down into this equation right so we're gonna have 5 is equal to 5 plus 1 you reduce that it's gonna be 5 is equal to 6 that is impossible 5 is not equal to 6 that doesn't make any sense at all that is a contradiction right so by that same token right this statement would be would be insane in a sense from what i understand because you were saying hey x is five it is always going to be exactly the same as five but that can't be true now that you're saying that x is somehow equal to itself plus one but it doesn't even make sense like that there's no sit i don't believe there's a situation in which that will be true ever i could be wrong not the first time but still uh, another thing we would expect by the identity property you have some function f right f of x does something it returns some value but you would anticipate that f of x is equal to f of x right if you ran this function with the value x right you would anticipate that you would get the same value no matter what but that if you are changing the environment or changing state this doesn't necessarily uh always hold right that so why but why is that a problem right that's for why would these why would these things be problems you know in regular programming imperative programming where you have a bunch of statements that change state like variables why would that be a problem well what if you have uh, some code different parts of your program that are running in sequence to each other like running on different threads right um, you know what could happen is you could have a situation in which you're either uh, your both threads are trying to write a value to the same space and then there's a you know an error occurs in that where the wrong value is put down or you might have a weird situation where your reading and writing are at completely different times and you might get problems with that and so by changing the environment uh, in such a heavy way it makes it really difficult uh, to deal with those sorts of problems when you're dealing with multi-threaded code Again, this is all from what I believe. Don't don't take my word as gospel. I'm not I'm not super big brain. Um but okay, sure. But are there any other things about functional programming? Well, it's it from what I understand it tries to be more declarative. You you're describing um not necessarily uh the steps for doing something, right? You're describing what you want done. Right, the example that I've heard, or that I, I usually hear when describing imperative versus declarative, is that say you went to a coffee shop, and you you walked up to the barista and you were like, "Hi, I want a mocha." The barista would be like, "Okay, yeah, I know how to make a a mocha," and they would make you your mocha, and you'd pay money and you'd you'd get your mocha. So that would be declarative. You're not saying you know, the particular steps for making a mocha, you're just saying, hey, I want a mocha. Uh, in the imperative style, you'd be like, hey, barista, I want you to go uh, grind some coffee beans, put it into that little, you know, press thing to put it into the espresso machine to make the shot of espresso. And then I want you in a separate container to pour milk, you know, in imperative style, you'd be laying out every single step in uh, that, that, process where uh, declarative is supposed to be a lot more high level i guess but so we're going to look at some haskell code 
and we're gonna write some Haskell code, and we're gonna have fun with it. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open GHCI. Uh, sweet. So what is GHCI? Uh, it stands for the uh, Glorious Haskell Compiler Interpreter. That's a lie. It stands for the Haskell. It's the Glasgow Haskell Compiler Interpreter. So it's like a REPL, like uh, in Python. Um, so you can enter in your um, statements and. Uh, you can interactively uh, try to actually wait a minute. Am I super stupid? Can I just um, HCI test? Uh... Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, let's just do it here. Who needs this terminal when I have got one right here? Okay, so you know, uh, here I can uh, do super cool things like one plus. Two, that's three. I can do five times, or I can do six times seven. It's the answer of life and everything. Um, uh, I can, I could do uh, five squared. I can say, hey, what is the remainder of dividing four by two? Um, you know, so on. But you might have noticed, like, why did I use these back ticks for mod? Well, mod, right, like this. This is also equivalent. Uh, because mod's a function. Mod's a function. Mod's a function. And that's, this is the first thing we're going to get into. Function. Functions. Functions. Okay, so I've written a function right here uh, called add, right? Hopefully you guys can see that. So you can see that we have the name of this function, and then we had have these two variable names, or these argument names, x and y. I always write the same function in Python. It'd be something like this, right? So again, at least with Haskell, it's very, very rooted in mathematics. We're basically saying that this expression, this function application, as it's called, where you have this the name of the function applied to its arguments. And again, you don't you don't do add parentheses, you know, one comma two. You would just have add one two. Space separated, no parentheses. I mean, use parentheses to group things still, but um, still, uh, so we're basically saying that this function application, right, this expression right here is the same thing as this expression. So from what I understand, if you were to time out, hey, actually let's, you know, to prove that I'm not crazy, let's reload this, add one and two, bam, look, it did it just like the plus operator. One plus two, it did the same thing. It did the same thing. And if I want it to be an infix operation, like four plus five, right? I want the operator, the function, to be in between the uh, operands, the arguments. I could do four, add five, nine. So those back ticks around the name of the function allows you to use the function in infix notation. Um, but so what we're saying here when we say something like add uh, three and four, what happens is, at least from my understanding, you have a statement like add three and four. So it looks up the definition of add, right? And we have the definition of add right here, right? So it's going to say, oh, okay, we have add, and it looks like we have all the arguments, x and y, and we're just going to replace this function application with the definition of the function. So we're going to have 
3 plus 4. Now to break that down a little bit, we're saying that Haskell looks at this and says, oh, well, you see, x is in the, uh, 3 is in the position of x, and 4 is in the position of y. So what we're going to do is we're just going to replace x and y in the expression as 3 and 4. So then it takes this expression, 3 plus 4, and it will eventually evaluate that to 7. That's another thing I want to touch on real quick. Haskell is lazy. What does that mean? Well, much like me with an essay for school, I will wait till the last possible moment to do the work. To bring this back to Haskell, once you have a computation, say you have something like, um, I want to have a constant, like, um, my favorite number, I could have this be as 2 times 3 times 7, right? But, 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 this is the important thing. Whereas in Python, or any other non-lazy or eager, you could say, language, it will immediately evaluate this this expression and save that into that namespace, my favorite number, right? And um, a way we can do, we could show this actually is we could do some improper Python code is we, and we could do something like, um, uh, I have no real value. Um, and we would call this print, wow, wowzers, this really be doing, right? And I could, um, let's do the same thing in Haskell. We could do, um, I have no real value, put string ln, wowzers, this really be doing. And so if I was to pop into Haskell, you would notice that it did not immediately print out the string, wowzers, this is really be doing. But if I type out, I have no real value, it will then print out that text. However, if I was to run that Python script, it would immediately print out that value, right? And of course, now this variable has the value of none, but my point still holds. Um, so basically what's going on is um, in Python and most other eagerly evaluated languages is that whenever you have an expression, um, you know, given that it's not tied up in like a function or something, it will immediately evaluate that expression, right? right then and there. Whereas with Haskell, it says, all right, yeah, okay, sure. You're saying that these things equal these values, okay? But I don't really have to figure out what exactly those values are unless you really make me do it, right? It's lazy. So in the case of Haskell, Right, if we go back, we run this again. You can see again, it, it did not print out that string. But in it, this case, when I say I, when I type out the name of this constant, I have no real value, it forces Haskell to evaluate this statement. In other words, to actually print that text onto the screen. Right? So it's been forced, Haskell's been forced to evaluate that expression. So it's lazy. And the same thing holds for my favorite number. Right? My favorite number. Right? Now it says that it's 42, but you know, it was super happy and just holding this as the expression it was. And you can leverage this by having uh, constants or uh, temporary constants in, uh, uh, in functions that 
can be very expensive computations that will not be evaluated unless you really make make it do so. Uh, one of the ways we can show this, uh, and if you want more like really good Haskell content, like to learn more Haskell and stuff like that, there's this channel called I think it's um, Soding, like that, like T S O D I N G. Really good channel. I've watched him, um, and I'm probably going. I'm probably gonna steal one of his things that he showed. Um, uh, as an example, uh, but you should, if you're really interested in Haskell, you should watch more of his stuff. He has this really good series called Haskell Rank, where he does programming problems in Haskell. The idea being that by you watching him implement all this stuff, he'll kind of pick up on how Haskell works and how to program in it, like a neural network. So great channel, you should check him out. Um, another thing, okay, so to prove this, what we're going to do is we're going to have some functions. We're going to have a function that um, uh, give first, and this thing is going to take two values, uh, an x and a y, and it's going to give us x. And we're going to have a second one called give second, which gets an x and a y and returns the second of the two. Right? Pretty simple stuff. But what if we have, um, what if we wanted a function that never stops, like it totally halts the program, basically gets it in an infinite loop. I'm going to call this stop, and I'm just going to say that stop is equal to itself. So what will happen if we try to evaluate stop? Well, if we are forced to evaluate stop, we're going to say, okay, we have to look up the name to see what it's equal to. Ah, oh, well, stop is equal to stop. Okay, but what's the value of that expression? Oh, well, it's equal to stop. Oh, okay, well, we have stop, which, you know, it'll go on and on forever, right? So what I can do is I can uh, reload this real quick, and I can say something like um, give first, um, 42 and stop and it'll give me 42 right notice that the program didn't completely halt and like stop forever um, but if I say give second it will now because it didn't evaluate 42 sure 42 doesn't really need any serious evaluation but that also means it didn't immediately call the function stop. So now it's evaluating stop. Now you can see that my interpreter has totally halted. And I can't do anything, so I have to control C out of there. Um, so that's cool. But let's try to do the same thing. God damn it. Let's try to see the same thing in, um, in Python. I'm going to alter the definition of stop because if I was to use recursion, it would uh, eventually blow the stack. Uh, so instead, I'm just going to say while true pass. Right? So this will enter an infinite loop. So we can all see the function stop when it's ran will, will do nothing. Right? It will do nothing. Well, actually, this might, might not work, too. Because... Hmm... Well, but that's the thing, because maybe this isn't a good example, because functions are first class objects. I don't care. Um, ah, this is going to bug me. I feel like this is less of a good, um, good example if I use Python, because functions are first class objects, so it won't necessarily. Um, ah, for fuck's sake. Who cares? Um, give first x, y, and we're going to return x, give second x, y, and uh, so 
I do print choose between 42 and stop our first of which we're gonna get give first and we're gonna give 42 and I guess stop and we're gonna call that bad boy um, so in the case of Haskell you know it didn't evaluate it but we're forcing the evaluation so this kind of might be a cheap uh, way to show this off so I apologize but you could see it neatly halts um, but then again, this isn't really a perfect one because I could just not call stop and since it's a first class object, it'll still give me 42. So it's not a perfect analogy, but still. Uh, analogy none the less. But in general, Python and other eager languages, they will evaluate the arguments to a function before it calls the function. How can I prove this? Uh, here. What we'll do is we'll modify first and we'll say print we are about to sh uh, about to return the first value which is x. But what we can do is we can we have x and y wrapped up in a function in which they basically just print some text and uh, return a value. We can call this uh, scream. Uh, we'll take a value and we'll take a string. And what we'll do is uh, what this will do is return a function screamer which will print the string out to the console and return the value and return screamer so what we can do is in this case because now we're forcing evaluation we can basically annotate our values no god damn it siri i'm not talking about you we can annotate our values uh touching 42 to basically see what values are actually being you know manipulated touched at all you know let's see and instead now what we're going to do is we're going to say that this is going to be, oh, I don't know, 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 5. Something crazy. Uh, touching crazy, uh, touching crazy kid over here. Actually, here. We'll modify the scream function so instead of just printing out uh, a string it'll print out a string with the value touching and we'll an exclamation point the idea being that I can show more effectively that um, what's going on is it's evaluating this thing I don't know why I care so much Honestly, I'm just here to program in Haskell, but whatever. Commended. Um, what? Hmm? Sure. Oh, wait, it's because I didn't... Ah, who cares? I'm done with this anyways. I want to program in Haskell. I'm done with this. Anyways, let's do some Haskell. Oh, my God. I 
If you want an exp a good ex explanation of that, just watch Soding, okay? I'm not here to give it good explanations on this because I'm I'm a newbie. I shouldn't be explaining it. I shouldn't. Okay. So let's write factorial. People like factorial. I usually write factorial whenever I am getting into ha uh, a language. So let's do factorial. Um, there's a couple different ways we can write factorial. Uh, so I'll show a, a few ways. Um, I'll show you the typical way that you would write it recursively in imperative language. So you would say something like, if n is less than or equal to zero, then you return one. Otherwise, you're going to return n times the factorial of n minus one. Right? I'm going to call this normy five. Normy normy factorial. Right. This is kind of the factorial that you would write in basically any other language if it was recursive, right? So you load that. Oh yeah, normy factorial. You know, I could calculate factorial five, factorial ten, you know, so on and so forth, factorial of a hundred, you know, all that good stuff. But you know, uh this you know what if I want something more interesting? I could do something like a pattern matching thing. What is pattern matching? Pattern matching allows you to take a data structure or value and kind of match it against certain cases and be able to do really cool stuff like extract values. But I could do something like um, pattern factorial. And what we're going to do here is we're going to say the, the factorial of 0 is 1. And then the factorial of any other number will just be that number times the pattern factorial of n minus 1. So, you know, this basically says exactly the same thing as this function, except this uses an if statement, and this uses just two pattern matches, right? And I can show you this this exact same thing. Pattern factorial. Factorial, if I can spell it right. Pattern factorial, factorial of 5, 120, of 10, 100. You know, it's the same thing. Um, different way of expressing it. Okay, what's another way you could do it? Well... You could, if you so pleased, you could do this same one another way. Guarded factorial. So instead of doing an equal sign, we're going to have n. We're going to drop down. We're going to have this vertical bar. This is, this is called a guard. So we'll check a condition before giving the expression that we should use. So for example, if n is less than or equal to 0, the expression we want to use is just one. Otherwise, no one other things. Otherwise is basically just like an else and an else clause. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're just going to do, you know, n times the guarded factorial of n minus one. Right? These all look pretty similar to each other, but, you know, what they're doing is obviously the same, but the way they're expressed is a little different. Guard factorial of 5, 120, 10, that one, 100, same thing. It's the same thing. Just written different ways, right? Okay, well, what's another way we could do it? Well, oh, goodness, what's another way you could do it? Well, if honestly, you could do something, um, you could do... If you wanted to have tail call optimization, this is the one that I like, tail factorial. Uh, you could do something like n, and then what you'll call is you'll call a tail, uh, or you'll call um, tail rec fact of n and 1. 
And but you, you know, you ask yourself, okay, wait. So we have this function tail factorial of n, but what it calls is just this other function called tail rec fact, and it has two arguments. Where is this function? Easy. I can define it specifically for this function with where, where the function tail, god damn it, tail rec fact of x and uh, tail rec fact of 0 and some accumulator, it's equal to the accumulator, and tail rec fact of literally any other number with any other accumulator, we're going to have this equal to the tail rec fact of x minus 1 with the accumulator being x times the accumulator, right? So this uses tail call optimization. So we do the brunt of the calculations before we recursively call the function. And that's that. And we can include this tail factorial of 5 is 120, of 10 is 100. Again, we've just expressed factorial in 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 different ways. It's another way. We're going to use a list factorial. In this one, what we're going to do is we're going to say of 0. I'll add you real quick. What's. What is that? Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 we can do this. We can do this. List factorial of 0 is 1. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to use this nifty function called product. It takes a list of numbers and it combines all those numbers by multiplying them together. And what is this list of numbers? It's going to be the range of numbers from 1 up to and including n. Okay. So let's try this out. List factorial of 0 is 1 of 5, 120 of 10. Wow, look at that. We have defined the factorial. Not once, not twice, not three times, but what is that? One, two, three, four, five different ways, my guy. Look at that. Look at that. That is amazing. That's so cool. So, but like, why? Why would you want all this? Well, you know, it can be ha handy in different situations, uh, depending. I honestly think I'm a big fan of, of the tail call optimization, so I'm a fan of this one. But also, just this one is so elegant. I mean, is, I mean, by golly. I mean, that's two lines. I mean, this is also two lines. But this uses no recursion at all, right? No recursion, no recursion, none. What, how, could we do the same thing in Python? I believe we can. I can't remember the name of the function. I think it's, or the module. I think it's uh, from func tools import reduce, right? I think this is it. Let's try to uh, write the, what we'll try to do is we'll try to write this right here, this code right here. We'll have to rewrite it in Python. So, def factorial of n. We're still going to need an if statement. If n is less than or equal to 0, we're going to return 1. Otherwise, return, reduce. And I think, ah, we take a function and then the sequence. So, what is the function going to be? We're going to get to that in a second. But what's going to be the sequence? It's going to be the range of numbers from 1 up to and including n. Okay. Um. Actually, what we can do is we can we can make this to we can make this less than less than two just as a nice little thing. Um, this function is going to be a lambda 
x and y, so it's going to take two arguments and it's going to just multiply them, right? So I'm going to get into Python from test import factorial. Factorial of 5, how does it 20? Of 10, of 0, of 100, same thing. Now it's a little, it's not as pretty, I don't think, as it is in Haskell. But that's also because, I don't know, Haskell's got a little, for Frick's sake. Haskell's just a very different looking language, which isn't a bad thing. Anyways, so that's a bunch of ways of writing uh, factorial. I don't know, did my, just, did my stream just crash? No, it did not. Good. Good, 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 good. Okay, so we can find all this. We did all that. That's really cool. What's another program that I like to write? Um, do you guys know the Kolatz conjecture? Pretty simple stuff. Take a take a number greater than one. Apply these two rules. Apply the following rules. Select n, n such that n is greater than 1. If n is odd, n will be equal to itself times 3 plus 1. If n is even, n will be equal to itself divided by 2. And the conjecture is n will eventually become 1 by these rules. Right. So what I like to do every now and then is I like to write up a program uh, to do this. But actually, let's, let's wait a second. I haven't even shown you how to make Hello World. What we'll do is make a function called name. We'll do put string Helen hello world. Chime test just okay. Now we should be able to. I'm just having problems with my end. I might be. I might be. I might be. You guys. I might be. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. It seems like it seems like I'm having problems. Okay, that's fine. Oh well. Who needs them? So that's it. I execute main, it says hello world. But what what is the type signature? What is the type signature of main? I O something. This weird empty parentheses thing. We might get back to that. I don't know if I'm going to try to explain it. Um, but keep that in mind. So we're going, I'm going to actually start typing out the type signatures. What we're going to do is we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to get an input from the user as a number. That number basically is going to be the number that we want to use these rules on. Right, so that should be pretty, pretty cool. Uh, let's see. So we're gonna get um input, and the way we're gonna do that is gonna get line. Well, we're gonna first say put string l. Um, enter an integer. Uh, to perform colats on. Do bug missed the expression here. Okay. I guess I'll do let number equals read input. I guess will this satisfy you, Haskell? 
Oh, and good. Oh, well. Say la vie. What we'll do is maybe we'll do something like. Um, Ah, we'll get back to this in a second. What I want to do is I want to make a function called something or other. It's going to apply a single collateral to a number. So it's going to be um, apply collats. This function is going to take an integer and it's going to return an integer. So apply collats if um, the it's going to be called n. If n is odd, so n is odd, we're going to return number times 3 plus 1. If it's even, we're going to, well, first of all, actually, I want to probably check. Is n equal to 1? If so, we're going to return n. I mean, yeah, 1. So if n is even, we're going to do integer division divided by 2. So this will apply a single collapse rule to it, right? So if n is 1, we're just going to return 1. If n is odd, then we multiply it by 3 and add 1. If it's even, we divide it by 2, right? What we're going to do next is... Basically, going to make a list of these colots numbers until it equals one. So this function is going to be uh, make colots list. I guess we'll take an integer. Um, take an integer, and it will basically just produce a list of integers as its output. Make collats list. This so will take a number, which is our current collats number. And I guess, uh, I don't know if I want to do this as, um, mm. we'll see. How about if n is one, we'll try returning an empty list make collats list any other number what we'll do is we'll add this number to a list well actually we'll do that we'll add n to a list of numbers and that list of numbers is made by make collats list and the numbers now the number we're gonna feed into that is going to be apply collats to n. So now because this does a single collats rule, this will basically recursively build up the list of these collats things. What we can do now, I'm gonna need to import something. Uh, Import, it's called control that and I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, map M. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. So. What we're going to do, we are going to map M. We don't care about the result. We're going to use put string ln. And the value that we're going to be printing out is on make collats list on our read input as an integer. Happy, oh my god, it's so unhappy. Namely, uh, 
can match image. Uh, Hmm. What's the type of read? Oh, and then good. Mm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Expected type string. Oh, I see. So I was trying to, right here, I was trying to output a string. Uh, list is not string. I need to apply show to turn it into a string. That still doesn't work, because of course it doesn't. Uh, is it because I need that type? So that's going to be an integer now. Almost. Oh, it's because of this. Oh, my God. Okay. Help. Errors are your friend. If I could figure out how I, what I'm doing. Uh, bleep, 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 bleep. Couldn't match charge. Hmm. It really can't be. This has nothing to do with it. I don't know. I'm just because I'm desperate. Hmm. Actually, how did I do it? In oh yeah, I know. I'm grasping at straws, but I want to see how I did it. Input still gets me. Yeah, read it. Come on in. Okay. What's the problem? I don't get you. You're making me feel sad inside. Hmm. Stand to. How on earth did I do this? Okay, let's try doing it of five. Does it even work with it? No. What? What on earth are you complaining about? This makes literally no sense. I don't understand it. It can't be because of parentheses. I know it, but I'm still gonna do it. Because I've lost it. Oh. 
Wait. I know what the problem was. I know what the problem was. I know what the problem was. I know, I know, I know it. Hey guys, I know it. Okay, cool. So, um, this is a list. This is turning list into string. This is trying to map the function for printing strings onto a string, which would be a list of characters. So, I need to map show onto it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it, guys. That's it. Oh my god, five. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I feel so sad. Here. Let's show that again. Uh, ten. Ten. Wow, look at that. It's beautiful. Now, if only I could have done that right the first time. That would have been so epic. Um, I'm getting kind of tired, but let me show you um, the, uh, the, the, the guessing game and rock, paper, scissors thing, I mean. So, I import this thing for random, and I import, I don't think I even use this, I think I can get rid of this, actually. I think. I think I can, I think I can. Here. Let's try, um, I guess in game. Yeah, okay. Jeez. Yeah, okay, so we should be all good. So how does this work? This is the main program. This is where we start. We get a number, a random number, between 1 and 100 using this function called random RIO. From what I understand, it allows you to get a random number within a range while using uh, the IO monad. Not going to explain that. And then we start up the guessing game by running this function called guess number. What guess number does is it will, it basically just asks what the guess is, it gets the input, and it turns the input into an integer and feeds it into this different function called give clue. What does give clue do? It takes the number that's guessed by the user and the actual number, and this is what basically cues the player in onto if they need to guess higher or lower or if they won, right? And so if the guess of the number from the player is less than the actual number, they say higher, and then we recursively call guess number so we can get another number as input to continue the game. If their guess is greater than the actual number, we say lower. Again, we recursively get another number to continue the loop. Otherwise, they have the exact number. We say you win, and that, and we uh, basically print out what the number was. And so basically, these two functions make up our main, our like game loop. Uh, so we can run this actually right here in this little terminal. Come here, come here. GCI guessing game. Call main. What is your guess? A hundred lower. Fifty higher. Seventy-five. Eighty. Uh, ninety-five. Oh wow! Look at that. Pretty slick. Pretty slick. Pretty slick. But what about my other one? The rock, paper, scissors. This is a little more complicated. So the main function, it gets the choice of the AI, like what they want to do for rock, paper, scissors, by randomly generating a number between one and three, where one is rock, two is paper, and three is scissors. Then we get an into we get a we get some input from the user. By this function, get user choice. It's right up here. Basically, it will make sure that the input is either a 1, 2, or 3. And if it's not any of those things, it recursively calls itself to get that uh, one of those numbers. Once we get the 
choices from both the player and the computer, we basically feed those into this function called outcome, and we print out you know who wins and who loses. So this function outcome takes the uh, choice from the computer and the player, and it basically goes through all the permutations of, oh, if the computer had the rock and the player had the paper, then they say, you know, paper beaks rock, you win, so on and so forth. And the otherwise, otherwise clause is basically, we've covered, covered all of our other permutations besides the, uh, the two choices being equal to each other, which means it's a tie. So we say it's a tie. And that's, that's that. And I can show you that it works real quick. Um, so GCI, rock, paper, scissors, main, god damn it. Main, I'm gonna pick paper. Paper beats rock, you win. A, uh, scissors. Rock beats scissors, you lose. Uh, uh, scissors. Rock beats scissors, you lose. Ah, oh, man. Scissors. Scissors beats paper, you win. Yo, man, I'm so good at rock, paper, scissors. Anyway, so that's that. Um, could show more interesting things. Um, but my brain is trying to slow down and I can feel it. So, if you have any suggestions for what I should program in Haskell to help me learn it, I'm thinking maybe... I might try to take a glance at um, uh, uh, parser combinators because I think it might be fun to make a little calculator uh, interpreter in uh, Haskell. Uh, that might be a little over my head, but I think it would be still pretty fun to do, especially because I'm a big fan of writing parsers and interpreters. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go now. I'm tired. Good night. Hope you sleep well, y'all.